Greetings students and welcome to another lesson on partial differential equations. In this video we're going to introduce the Fourier transform and discuss how it can be used to solve PDE problems. In this video we'll focus particularly on the heat equation. Now in my video on PDEs and Laplace transforms I mentioned how Laplace transforms were particularly useful for PDEs with semi-infinite spatial domains, that is, where x varies from 0 to infinity. Fourier transforms, on the other hand, are particularly useful for PDEs on infinite spatial domains, where x can go from negative infinity to infinity. The first part of my video will be an introduction to the idea of Fourier transforms. It'll be very similar to the introductory part in my Laplace transforms video. For those of you being introduced to the integral transform concept for the first time, I encourage you to watch this introduction. And for those of you who've already seen my Laplace transform video, I'll put a timestamp in the description to skip this first part and go straight to solving PDE problems. Now what is the Fourier transform? Well, it's a special type of integral transform. Its job is to transform a function using an integration operation. Essentially, it changes a function f of x to another function f hat of omega using this integration formula, where f hat of omega, the Fourier transform of f of x, is the uh, 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x times the exponential of negative i omega x with respect to x. The i, of course, is the imaginary number here. The Fourier transform is also invertible, which means I can take my f hat of omega and get f of x from it using something called the inverse Fourier transform, which I can find using the 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f hat of omega times the exponential of i omega x with respect to omega. So these equations for the Fourier transform and its inverse are all fine, but let me explain why the Fourier transform is useful when solving both ODEs and PDEs. If I have an ordinary differential equation, like the second derivative of f with respect to x is some function g of x, f, and df by dx, then because the Fourier transform is an integral transform, you can intuitively imagine that if I apply the transform to this differential equation, I will in fact integrate out one of the variables. In this case, if I integrate out the x completely, I won't be left with any derivatives. And in the end, I'll just be solving an algebraic equation for the Fourier transform of f hat of omega, which is the Fourier transform of f of x. Now, once I've solved this algebraic equation for f hat of omega, I can take the inverse transform of both sides to get the solution for our function f of x. The inverse transform essentially converts a Fourier transformed function f hat of omega to the original function f of x. This inverse transform stage is often the hardest part because there's a lot of work that goes into manipulating f hat of omega so that we can eventually find the inverse transform. In addition, there's a lot of complicated functions out there whose inverse transforms are nearly impossible to find. Now what about for partial differential equations? Well, suppose I have a partial differential equation like the one-dimensional heat equation, which involves a function u of x comma t. Now what I can do is take the Fourier transform of this PDE with respect to the position variable x, and as I mentioned before, when I take the Fourier transform with respect to an independent variable, which is an integral transform, it's as if I'm integrating out that independent variable. So when we integrate out the x in this PDE, will be left with a differential equation in T, which is simply an ODE. Again, once I solve this ODE, I'll end up with a solution for u hat of omega comma T, which I can use to get u of x comma T by taking an inverse transform. By a similar logic, if my PDE involves partial derivatives in n independent variables, then taking the Fourier transform of that PDE with respect to one of those independent variables will result in a new PDE with n minus 1 independent variables because again the Fourier integral transform integrates out one of those variables. As a result the Fourier transform makes our differential equation simpler. Again the hardest part is usually at the last step when you need to find the inverse Fourier. Now for ease of reference I'm going to summarize the Fourier transform process right here. So we start off with a differential equation involving the function u of x. u could still depend on other independent variables like y, z, and t, but I've only written down x because that's what we're Fourier transforming. Then what we do is we take the Fourier transform of this differential equation to end up with a simpler equation involving u hat of omega, the Fourier transform of u of x. This is step one. 
Now, this equation could be an algebraic equation, it could be an ODE, it could be a less complex PDE as we just discussed, but the idea behind this equation is that it's easier to solve than the original differential equation. In step two, we're gonna solve the simpler equation to end up with an expression for u hat of omega. And finally, in step three, we'll take the inverse transform of u hat. And what happens when we take the inverse transform of u hat? Well, we'll end up with an explicit equation for u of x. Now, before we get to solving PDEs using Fourier transforms, I wanna quickly go over some properties of the Fourier transform, particularly when it comes to the derivatives of a function. Now say I have a function u of x comma t and I'm taking its Fourier transform with respect to x and say that the Fourier transform of u is u hat, which is given by this integral per the definition of the Fourier transform. Now suppose that I wanna find the Fourier transform of the nth partial of u with respect to x. To find this Fourier transform, I'll have to use the fact that the nth derivative of u with respect to x is the nth derivative of the inverse Fourier transform of u hat. And that makes sense because u is pretty much equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of u, so the inverse Fourier transform of u hat. Now, since the integral on the right is integrating out the omega and not the x, it is a definite integral with d omega at the end after all, and since u hat should be continuous and differentiable, we are allowed to differentiate under the integral sign. But the nth derivative in x inside this integral is just the nth derivative of the exponential. Since the u hat doesn't contain x, it's only got the omega. So u hat is basically a constant as far as this derivative is concerned. And when you calculate the nth derivative of the exponential with respect to x, you'll still get the same exponential, but the i omega will come out front with each derivative. So if you differentiate n times, the i omega will come out n times. So this is what we'll end up with. And finally, based on the definition of the inverse Fourier transform, if you have to take the inverse Fourier transform of this function to get the nth partial of u with respect to x, that would mean the Fourier transform of the nth partial of u is then this function that I've circled. Therefore, the Fourier transform of the nth partial of u with respect to x, where x is the variable that's being integrated out in the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform is given by i omega to the n, times the Fourier transform of u alone, which is just our u hat. So this is the first property of the Fourier transform. Let's discuss the second property, which is the Fourier transform of a derivative with respect to the variable that's not involved in the transform. So in this case, we're Fourier transforming with respect to x, but our derivative is with respect to t. This should be a relatively quick derivation. By the definition of the Fourier transform, the transform of the nth time derivative of u is given by the following. And since I'm not integrating with respect to t, I can take this time derivative outside the integral since the time derivative is irrelevant to our integration. Now the integral that's left inside is just the Fourier transform of u. So the Fourier transform of the time derivative of u is the time derivative of the Fourier transform. Again, time is the variable that's not being integrated out in the Fourier transform. And the third and final property of Fourier transforms that I'll discuss here is the convolution property, which is based on the convolution theorem. It states that the Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions is the product of their individual Fourier transforms. I've stated this property without proof here, but if you want the proof, you can head over to my introductory video on convolution. Links in the description. Now I'm going to spend the rest of the video using the Fourier transform to solve a simple PDE problem. Suppose that I have a rod of infinite length with an initial temperature distribution of phi of x. Suppose also that heat is transmitted along this rod only by conduction, so the PDE governing the transfer of heat along this rod is given by the typical heat equation, where alpha squared is the thermal diffusivity of the rod and u of x comma t is the unknown temperature distribution at time t. Since the rod is infinite, there aren't any boundary conditions, so we only have the initial condition that the temperature distribution at time zero is phi of x. And because the rod is infinite, our position variable x can vary from negative infinity to infinity. And for this reason, it makes sense to use the Fourier transform because the Fourier transform equation also integrates from negative infinity to infinity. So we'll Fourier transform both the PDE and the initial condition. And assuming the Fourier transform of u is u hat of omega comma t, the Fourier transform of the PDE is given by the partial of u hat with respect to t equals negative alpha squared omega squared u hat, according to the first and second properties I discussed earlier.
Meanwhile, the Fourier transform of the initial condition gives me some function that I'll call psi of omega, which I'll suppose is the Fourier transform of phi of x. The next step is to solve the Fourier transformed problem. This actually isn't too difficult. The first order differential equation in time can be solved by separation of variables. So the dt goes on the right and the u hat goes on the left. Integrating both sides gives us the following. And then when I take the exponential of both sides, here's what I'll end up with, where a is just the exponential of c. And to find a, I can apply the initial condition. So at t0, u hat is psi of omega, which then makes a equal to psi of omega which means that the solution to my Fourier transform PDE is the following. And this is where we'll move to the third step, which is to take the inverse Fourier transform. And if we take the inverse Fourier transform of u hat, this is what our equation will look like. Now the inverse Fourier transform on the left is just u of x comma t, but the inverse Fourier transform on the right is gonna be a bit difficult to handle. There is one trick though we can use to make the right-hand side more manageable, and that trick is the convolution theorem. From the convolution theorem, the product of the Fourier transform of two functions is equivalent to the Fourier transform of their convolution. In this case, we're multiplying the Fourier transform of phi of x, which is psi, and this exponential, which is presumably the Fourier transform of some function that we haven't figured out yet. So by the convolution theorem, we can write the product of these Fourier transforms as the Fourier transform of the convolution of the original two functions. And when we do that, u becomes the following. This dot dot dot, by the way, represents the inverse Fourier transform of this exponential term. And if you look it up in Fourier transform tables, or if you calculate it yourself, you'll find that it's equal to 1 over alpha times the square root of 2t times the exponential of negative x squared over 4 alpha squared times t. And of course, in front of the 1 over alpha square root of 2t, there's an additional 1 over square root of 2 pi, which then would make this 1 over 2 alpha square root of pi times t out front. Now the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform is just the function itself. So u of x comma t is then the convolution of these two functions. Recall that the convolution of two functions f and g is given by the following, where tau is some dummy variable we're integrating over. And using the definition of convolution, u of x comma t finally becomes the following, where y is just the dummy variable, kind of like the tau in the definition of my convolution here. And so in the end, this is the solution to my heat equation on an infinite rod, which I found using Fourier transforms. Before I end this video, there's a couple of important points I'd like to mention. The first is that this exponential function in the integral for u, the function multiplying the phi along with the constant out front, this function, which I'll call g of x comma t, is called the Green's function. The Green's function essentially describes how the PDE responds when you have a delta function input, so an impulse input. So basically, if my initial condition phi of x, which is the only input that I have for the system really, if my initial condition was a delta function, you could show using the properties of delta functions that u of x comma t would be equal to the Green's function. If I had some more complex input, I would need to break up that input into impulses and sum the response to each of those impulses. In other words, I would need to integrate my g with that complex input to find the response u to that more complex input. If you need more details, I encourage you to check out my videos on Green's functions, links in the description. And the second thing I'll mention is that the Fourier transform doesn't always exist for every function. For instance, you can show that a constant function and an exponential function don't have Fourier transforms because the integral doesn't converge to some fixed value. So even functions that have Laplace transforms don't really have Fourier transforms, so that's something to keep in mind. Anyway, that should do it for the lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.